This is the Navy's elite special warfare team, the SEALs. Their tactic is to inflict maximum devastation with minimum manpower. Their attack relies on intense violence and an all-out fury to stun their target. And quickly fade away in the confusion. They've been called the world's most effective fighting force. They can operate in any environment. Jump from planes, drop from helicopters, dive into the ocean and stay submerged for hours and emerge ready to fight. For SEALs operating far from the protection of the main force, the difference between living and dying is measured in seconds and depends on seeing and engaging the enemy before they can be seen. Today, thanks to Navy surgeons, SEALs have a new fighting edge, laser vision. It's not science fiction, it's now. This is today's Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. Together, they're the most advanced fighting force on the planet and beyond. The biggest advantage in combat has always been to be able to see your enemy before he sees you. Today, that means orbiting surveillance satellites capable of reading the license number on a vehicle 500 miles below. Or goggles that can amplify the light of a star thousands of times and turn night into day. Tight formation coming in. It means a pilot sitting in a control room in New Mexico can track down an enemy on the other side of the world and if necessary, lock up target five, eliminate them. Two, one. Impact. New technologies have enormously enhanced our ability to see the enemy first. But these are all just extensions of the human eye. And they are all subject to its limitations. Right now in the Air Force, over 45% of everyone in the Air Force is nearsighted and needs corrective lenses in order to do their jobs. Perfect. Colonel Charles Riley is an ophthalmic surgeon and consultant to the Air Force Surgeon General for refractive surgery. For more than a decade, Dr. Riley and other military surgeons have been using laser refractive surgery to enhance the human weapon system. Uh, we talk about upgrading our avionics in an airplane so they can see out further, see the bad guys sooner. Well, that's what we were doing with our laser for the human weapon system. The most important weapon system in the cockpit is that human. And so to be able to offer them that upgrade in their avionics is priceless. It really is priceless. In 2000, the Department of Defense established the Warfighter Refractive Eye Surgery Program. It grew out of an experiment begun years earlier among the Navy's SEALs. SEALs go through what is considered to be the most mentally and physically demanding of any military training. Glasses or contact lenses are not an option. Rather than lose well-qualified candidates because of poor eyesight, the Navy began exploring the potential of correcting their eyesight with laser refractive surgery. In 1997, after several years of highly successful trials, the Navy began offering the surgery to qualified SEAL candidates. Within a year, laser vision correction was adopted for use by the Special Operations Forces in all branches. Over the past 10 years, the mission has expanded even further. Today, all military personnel headed into combat are eligible for refractive surgery. To date, nearly a half million American frontline troops have had their procedure. To handle the increasing demand, the military maintains 20 warfighter refractive surgery centers at U.S. bases around the world. 
Commander Elizabeth Hoffmeister is a flight surgeon at one of them, the Naval Medical Center, San Diego. She was one of the researchers involved in the Navy's trials of laser refractive surgery. We now have seven centers in the Navy and do approximately 13,000 procedures a year. And the goal would be to not have anyone have to deploy into theater requiring glasses. Commander Hoffmeister used to need corrective lenses, but had the procedure herself before a recent deployment to Afghanistan. It's a huge issue, and that's just for me, I'm a doctor on the back lines, you know. Imagine the benefit to the actual frontline warfighter, and it, it could mean not just an inconvenience and doing well on the rifle range, but it means the difference between living and dying. It, it's that important. When we send a soldier off for deployment, that's one of the things that we as commanders have to do. We have to make sure that they are well trained, well equipped. If we can make him better and he is qualified for corrective surgery for his eyes, let's do it. General Frank Helmick is commanding general of the Army's 18th Airborne, the Rapid Deployment Force, and the deputy commanding general of U.S. forces in Iraq. He's had LASIK surgery himself. And our military has an advantage over our adversaries on almost everything, I think. And LASIK surgery is just another indication of that. I think it's pretty well understood how difficult it is for an individual to make it through SEAL training. Captain Frank Butler understands. Before becoming an ophthalmologist, he was a platoon officer in underwater demolitions with SEAL Team One. What's not well understood is how difficult it is for an individual just to get into SEAL training. You have to be in great physical shape, but you also have to be free from any significant physical defects. And poor vision due to refractive error was one of the biggest things that kept people out of SEAL training. I was told, listen, your eyes are outside the limitations and, you know, I had pretty much come to grips with the fact that I wasn't going to be able to go into the SEAL teams um, towards the end of my junior year and beginning of my senior year. And I was heartbroken. Try to recreate the experience of having to defend yourself. Ever and since so high school, Clint Bruce wanted to be a SEAL and he seemed to be the perfect candidate. He had been appointed to the Naval Academy. He was in peak physical condition, playing linebacker on the team that took Navy to its first bowl win in 15 years. The initial hit by Clint. The Saints and the Ravens made him offers, but his vision, 2040 in one eye and 2070 in the other, wasn't up to SEAL standards. But the SEAL community wasn't ready to give up on Bruce. And that's when they pulled me aside and they said, listen, you did a great job in your interview. Uh, obviously, we know what you're made of because we've watched you play ball for the last few years. And we know you're probably smarter than your grades would indicate. Um, and that's when they let me know about the program. The program was laser refractive surgery. It began quietly in 1993 as an experiment. Captain Butler had convinced the Navy command that it offered two enormous benefits. It would free combat troops from glasses or contacts, and it could greatly expand the pool of eligible talent. Wouldn't it be great if we could fix their refractive error and capture all of these great athletes and great leaders into our community? With the go-ahead from the Navy, the next step was to set up a clinical trial. That took Captain Butler to the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, where he met Captain Steve Schauhorn. Frank Butler and I connected. And, and we connected in many different ways because he was a full Navy SEAL before he went into medical school and became an ophthalmologist. I was a Navy pilot. I flew F-14s. I was a Top Gun instructor before I went into medical school and went into ophthalmology. And Frank had the vision to say, this could be of great benefit. The clinical study belonged to Dr. Shellhorn. He did 30 patients. And the results from Dr. Shellhorn's study were spectacular. All 30 of the patients had 20-20 vision or better after the surgery, after having had very bad vision pre-op. His results were excellent. Looks good, Paul, looks real good. In the civilian community, the FDA was also conducting clinical trials. Those results were equally impressive. 
And I move beyond that. Environmental concerns and issues that the military had unique to their population, like high altitude, high G, hyperbaria, underwater, blowing sand conditions. It was amazing how well uh, folks did uh, that, that in all the environmental studies that we looked at. Not only did Dr. Schauhorn test the SEAL's vision before and after surgery, he also looked at their job performance. And what did we find? Better performance after laser vision correction. Well, better is a good thing, and that's why I was like, dude, this is pretty darn awesome. And all the studies lined up very similar to that. By 1997, the Navy's Special Warfare Command was making the surgery available to all active duty SEALs and offering it to outstanding SEAL candidates. One of them was Clint Bruce. I remember sitting with my classmates and they said, you know, Bruce, Naval Special Warfare. And I, it, was, it, was, it was pretty overwhelming. Captain Butler had decided to give me a waiver that it had become available for the special operations community on a test basis, and that if I made it through training, they would have given me an opportunity to go through the, go through the procedure. But at least this time, you won't be dependent on glasses. It Here's wasn't long before the word was out about the program and the SEAL's new fighting edge. At Fort Bragg, ophthalmic surgeon Colonel Scott Barnes began looking at the potential of refractive surgery for the Army Special Forces. Some of these classified units that don't exist, but if they did exist, they interact with Navy uh, SEALs, Navy Special Operators, and they talk about what, what's going on. Hey, how'd you get this? What do you mean you don't wear glasses anymore? And these classified units are really the elite of the elite. They are really catered to because they do some very difficult, very tough things. And so when they kind of started pushing, saying, hey, we want this laser surgery, um, it caught the ears of the senior people that, that kind of run the show in the Army, and they said, hey, we need to pay attention because they think this thing is going to make a difference for them. Since then, the Army has enthusiastically embraced laser refractive surgery. It's estimated that over the past 10 years, more than 200,000 soldiers have had the procedure. One of the first was Dr. Barnes himself. That's great, almost finished. Having a soldier put his life on the line and come back and say, thank you, because I can see and I did my job, and I came back to my family and my children because I saw through that ambush because you did surgery on me. Priceless. The operational forces, the people that go into harm's way, the aviators, the Marines, they pretty clearly saw the advantages. It became pretty apparent to me that those same advantages, and maybe even more, and in a different way, would be applicable to naval <laughs> aviators. And so I became interested in looking at the, the aviation side of laser vision correction very, very early on. The whole concept of refractive surgery actually began 50 years earlier as an effort to improve the vision of pilots. In the days leading up to the Second World War, Japan was building the world's largest air force, amassing thousands of warplanes but they didn't have enough qualified pilots. An unusually large proportion, 44% of Japanese, are myopic or nearsighted. Myopia is caused by a cornea that is too curved for the length of the eye or an elongated eyeball. This causes light to focus in front of the retina instead of on the retina. The Japanese war ministry named Tomatsu Sato, a well-known ophthalmologist and researcher, to find a way to treat myopia. Sato made incisions into the cornea, causing it to flatten. This, he reasoned, would move the focus to the correct point on the retina. Although he had some success, his results were too inconsistent, and interest in refractive surgery ended with the Japanese war effort. and people will see the beautiful field. It was revived 30 years later when a flamboyant Russian ophthalmologist, Satislav Fyodorov, announced he had developed a cure for myopia. Dr. Fyodorov's approach was to make a series of cuts radiating from the center of the cornea, producing a controlled amount of correction, a procedure he called radial keratotomy. He set up clinics across the Soviet Union with hundreds of technicians, each trained to do just one specific step of the procedure. 
The results of his radial keratotomy, or RK as it came to be known, were basically good, but not always predictable. About a third of his patients were overcorrected or undercorrected. RK all but disappeared when in 1980, the National Eye Institute issued a public warning about its safety and effectiveness. That prompted the Department of Defense to ban RK and all forms of refractive surgery for members of the U.S. Armed Forces. The military's ban remained in effect for nearly 15 years until Butler and Schallhorn convinced the Navy that a new form of refractive surgery was worth consideration. PRK, or photorefractive keratectomy, was a totally new approach. It used a laser to reshape the cornea instead of a scalpel. The cornea is protected by a thin layer of epithelial cells which must be removed before the laser can be applied. Each pulse of laser energy is computer guided to a predetermined spot in the treatment zone where it removes a minute portion of corneal tissue. After thousands of pulses, the result is a precisely reshaped cornea, slightly flatter, bringing the myopic eye into focus. In the civilian community, early trials showed even patients with high levels of refractive errors were achieving excellent results with PRK. One of the largest clinical trials of the procedure was the Navy's accessioning study conducted by Captain Schallhorn. 700 candidates who failed the vision standards for naval aviation were treated with PRK and then allowed into flight training. And we followed and tracked them through flight training and compared them to their peers at the end of that study. In that comparison, we found that people that had PRK actually did better. And one important one was they had a lower what we call attrition rate. Their dropout rate was less. And that is very significant because it costs an awful lot to train a naval aviator. So not only would, did that study allow a wider pool of applicants in to become Navy pilots, which is of, of great benefit, but it also had cost savings associated with it. So that study was, was phenomenally successful in that respect. Despite the glowing results, Captain Schallhorn wasn't ready to recommend PRK for naval aviators. PRK has what I call an Achilles heel. It has a, a major issue for aviation, and that is slow visual recovery. It takes time. It can take weeks, sometimes months, to get the excellent vision that we want after PRK. That has great implication for aviation. So LASIK offers faster visual recovery. So if we can get an aviator, what we call back in the cockpit faster, it's a huge benefit. And not only to the aviator, but also in a cost saving sense, because to requalify an aviator can be very expensive depending on how far outside of a week that aviator is from having landed on an aircraft carrier. It takes a while for the epithelial cells on the surface of the cornea to grow back. As they do, vision improves, but it could take up to 90 days before full correction was realized. Three months downtime is a serious setback for a Navy pilot. Captain Schallhorn turned his attention to a new variation of laser refractive surgery that had the advantage of much quicker recovery. The procedure, being called LASIK, had a big bonus. Patients were having optimal vision within hours or days, not weeks and months. Instead of reshaping the surface of the cornea, as with PRK, LASIK reshapes the inner tissue of the cornea. An ultra-fine blade cuts a thin flap across the top of the cornea. This is set aside while the laser sculpts the inner surface. Once the proper correction is achieved, the flap is laid back in place. After a few minutes, as the flap dries, it rebonds with the surface of the cornea. No stitches are required. Although LASIK had the advantage of faster visual recovery, the quality of vision, especially night vision, wasn't as sharp as Dr. Schallhorn demanded for pilots. It was at about this time that a new technology came on the scene, wavefront aberrometry. NASA had used it to analyze and correct optical problems with their orbiting Hubble telescope. With wavefront, a beam of light is shined into an optic system. The light wave that's reflected back is then analyzed to detect any abnormalities, even the most minute. 
Dr. Schallhorn began using Wavefront to analyze defects in the human optical system. This analysis was then used to guide the laser to correct for each of those defects. We combined the technology, a Wavefront guider, a custom procedure to sculpt the cornea and and correct the refractive error in a procedure that was really a new form of LASIK. And it was that new form of LASIK that we found overcame the problems that we'd seen previously with LASIK regarding the quality of vision. But Captain Schallhorn still wasn't ready to recommend LASIK. He had one last concern. How stable the LASIK flap is, is a critical consideration. Um, uh, if an aviator has to eject, we don't want that flap, that LASIK flap moving. Since the LASIK flap is cut by a mechanical blade, Captain Schallhorn was concerned that it could be dislodged by impact. But there was new laser technology on the horizon that appeared to have the potential to create the LASIK flap without a blade. It was called a femtosecond laser, thousands of times more intense than conventional lasers and capable of unsurpassed precision. Each pulse of energy is extremely short, a femtosecond, one millionth of a billionth of a second. Firing thousands of pulses along a plane creates a layer of minute bubbles just below the surface of the cornea. The top layer separates as if along a perforated line, creating a perfectly uniform flap without a blade. The laser cut flap has a perfectly vertical edge, which when returned to the cornea, locks into place like a piece into a jigsaw puzzle. Captain Schallhorn was finally satisfied and this new technology LASIK was approved for naval aviators. After combining these two technologies, the femtosecond laser to make the, the LASIK flap with a wavefront guided or custom treatment to correct for the refractive error, the sum was greater than the parts. With this new combined technology approach, Dr. Schallhorn and his team of Navy surgeons were able to take laser vision correction to a whole new level. The results that we've been seeing with our aviation uh, study have been, have been phenomenal. One of the surgeons on that team was Captain David Tanzer. Using this new form of LASIK in Navy pilots, Captain Tanzer was routinely producing vision well beyond what's considered normal. 100% of our aviators we've treated are 2020 or better uncorrected. 98% are 2016 or better uncorrected. 92% are 2012 or better uncorrected. And about 35% are 2010. They max out our eye chart. So we're actually giving them vision as good as they can get. Good. Watch it, watch it carefully. Good, 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 good. Certainly there will be people in the civilian population that achieve these results. Others should not have the expectation of vision of 2020 or better than 2020. Epithelium probably is about 50 microns. But... Dr. Doug Koch is a professor of ophthalmology at Baylor College of Medicine, specializing in refractive surgery. He says fewer patients in the civilian population have the same potential for visual outcomes as Navy pilots. Well, the military's visual results are obviously outstanding. And I think the population is sort of unique. These are p people who have very, very outstanding potential for vision. We can help patients understand what their potential for vision will be by a care very careful screening process. The Navy's aviator clinical trials helped advance the state of the art in refractive surgery and made a compelling case that advanced LASIK could withstand the most extreme rigors of warfare and flight. We looked at patients before and after this new technology LASIK, femtosecond and wavefront guided, and we found for the first time this new technology LASIK actually resulted in an improvement in night vision on average for patients. The first time we'd ever seen that in a refractive procedure. And that analysis led me to say finally, I think we're ready to do LASIK in aviators. That opened the door for LASIK in space. And in 2007, NASA also approved the procedure. I wore contact lenses during my three space walks. Former astronaut Pierre Thuet is a veteran of three shuttle flights and has logged 18 hours on spacewalks, all wearing contact lenses. There is that concern that, that if you know, one of them got dislodged or, or just moved on your eye, because you can't put your fingers up there and move them back, you, you'd be in difficulty. I certainly would have preferred to have had perfect vision like I do now, thanks to LASIK. 
NASA had a strict prohibition against refractive surgery, and Captain Thuad couldn't get LASIK until he left the astronaut program and returned to the Navy. Uh, NASA wouldn't have approved LASIK for the astronauts if they didn't think it was, you know, absolutely certain that it would work for the astronauts and would provide them better acuity and allow them to do their jobs better. And that represents a real milestone. NASA looked at the safety and effectiveness of of LASIK in great detail over the years, and they have deemed it safe and effective for use in their astronauts. We should take great comfort in that, um, in knowing that it has reached that level. Due in great part to the pioneering research conducted by the Navy, the combined form of LASIK has become the gold standard for laser vision correction. Okay. What I call the best of the best is uh, creating the, the LASIK flap the protective LASIK flap with a femtosecond laser, correcting the refractive error with a wavefront guided treatment, which again, under computer control sculpts the cornea. That's how far we've gone with this technology. That's the best of the best. Often referred to as all laser LASIK, this combined procedure is producing a revolution in both the military and civilian communities. It used to be that aviation required excellent vision with no glasses, 20-20 or better in each eye. And with this program now, it's opened the vista up for folks to have laser vision correction and enter as Navy pilots and aspire to a new dream. The two things that mean the most to me about the refractive surgery program is that it has enabled more young men to walk through that front door and have their shot at becoming a SEAL. Secondly, from the community standpoint, it has enabled the SEAL community to make sure that we don't lose someone who might have been a great SEAL just because he needed glasses. I'm that guy. I'm, and there's, you know, there's a half a million other like me that have an opportunity to do something that they wouldn't have been able to do were it not for this program and this procedure, and for, for guys like Dr. Butler. With the military research efforts, they have very much complemented what we knew and learned from the civilian population. They were able to do larger studies, more focused studies on certain types of issues so that we really expanded our knowledge and understanding of how to make it better, how to provide better quality vision, make it safer, and really broaden the population who can truly benefit from the operation.